In this mini documentary, I tell you the true story of how a ghost ship that drifted into Norway and ran aground off the coast near Bergen killed one-third of the country's population in a story that sounds like it came straight out of a horror movie. What was this ship carrying that was so deadly, and what happened to her crew? Let's find out. If you enjoy audio-based content like this, I've not only made and narrated a lot of original audio stories that I've written, but I've also recently released a full-length documentary about the complete history of the Loch Ness Monster. So please check those out after this. Their respective playlists are linked below, and be sure to like and subscribe if this kind of content interests you because I plan to make mini documentaries a semi-regular thing this year. And full-length ones over topics I find interesting and want to research will be an every few months thing. Alright, let's get to the story. Picture yourself in the 14th century. You're sitting in a small boat and are part of a small team being sent out to investigate the seemingly derelict ship that ran aground near the port. You row out to the vessel on board, intending to speak with the captain and crew about why they have blatantly violated the quarantine procedure your kingdom expects all ships to abide by, only to find the whole crew lying in their bunks oozing pus and blood from open wounds the size of apples, all having died so fast no one was left to tend to or move the bodies. And you realize what has happened, and it's a nightmare scenario. You look at the people you boarded with in terror and don't know if any of you will survive, or how many other people are about to die because of the horror you found on the ghost ship that drifted into your harbor. Fleeing the ship is probably going to do no good. The worst case scenario has just happened. And untold thousands are about to die. To understand how a ghost ship could kill so many people, and why finding the crew all dead would have been especially terrifying to those who made the discovery, you need to understand the backstory to this event, and why the thing this ship was carrying was so dangerous. A good way to get some context is to hear it straight from the written words of someone from the era. Let me say, then, that 1348 years had already passed after the fruitful incarnation of the Son of God, when, into the distinguished city of Florence, there came a deadly pestilence. Either because of the influence of heavenly bodies, or because of God's just wrath as punishment to mortals for our wicked deeds, the pestilence, originating some years earlier in the East, killed an infinite number of people as it spread relentlessly from one place to another, until finally it had stretched its miserable length all over the West. And again, this pestilence, no human wisdom or foresight, was of any avail. Quantities of filth were removed from the city by officials charged with the task. The entry of any sick person into the city was prohibited, and many directives were issued concerning the maintenance of good health. Nor were the humble supplications rendered not once, but many times, by the pious to God, through processions, or by other means, in any way, efficacious. Almost at the beginning of springtime of that year in question, the plague began to show its sorrowful effects in an extraordinary manner. It did not assume the form it had in the east, where bleeding from the nose was a manifest sign of inevitable death, but rather showed its first signs in men and women alike by means of swellings, either in the groin or under the armpits, some of which grew to the size of an ordinary apple and others to the size of an egg, more or less. And people called them gabascioli, ubos. And from the two parts of the body already mentioned in very little time, said deadly gabascioli began to spread indiscriminately over every part of the body. Then, after this, 
the symptoms of the illness changed to black or livid spots appearing on the arms and thighs and on every part of the body. Sometimes there were large ones, and other times a number of little ones scattered all around. And just as the Gavaccioli were originally, and still are, a very definite indication of impending death. In like manner, these spots came to mean the same thing for whoever contracted them. Neither a doctor's advice nor the strength of medicine could do anything to cure this illness. On the contrary, either the nature of the illness was such that it afforded no cure, or else the doctors were so ignorant that they could not recognize its cause and, as a result, could not prescribe the proper remedy. In fact, the number of doctors, other than the well-trained, was increased by the large number of men and women who had never had any medicine training. At any rate, few of the sick were ever cured, and almost all died after the third day of the appearance of the previously described symptoms, some sooner, others later, and most of them died without fever or any other side effects. This pestilence was so powerful that it was transmitted to the healthy by contact with the sick, the way a fire close to dry or oily things will set them aflame. And the evil of the plague went even further. Not only did talking to or being around the sick bring infection and common death, but also touching the clothes of the sick or anything touched by them or used by them seemed to communicate this very disease to the person involved. There were some people who thought that living moderately and avoiding any excess might help a great deal in resisting the disease, and so they gathered in small groups and lived entirely apart from everyone else. They shut themselves up in those houses where there were no sick people, and where one could live well by eating the most delicate of foods and drinking the finest of wines, allowing no one to speak about or listen to anything said about the sick and the dead outside. These people lived entertaining themselves with music and other pleasures that they could arrange. Others thought the opposite. They believed that drinking excessively, enjoying life, going about singing and celebrating, satisfying in every way, appetites as the best one could, laughing and making light of everything that happened was the best medicine for such a disease. So they practiced to the fullest what they believed by going from one tavern to another, all day and night, drinking to excess, and they would often make merry in private homes, doing everything that pleased or amused them most. This they were able to do easily. For everyone felt he was doomed to die and, as a result, abandoned his property, so that most of the houses had become common property, and any stranger who came upon them used them as if her were their rightful owner. Many ended their lives in the public streets during the day or at night, while many others who died in their homes were discovered dead by their neighbors only by the smell of their decomposing bodies. The city was full of corpses. Moreover, the dead were honored with no tears or candles or funeral mourners. In fact, things had reached such a point that the people who died were cared for as we care for goats today. So many corpses would arrive in front of a church every day and every hour that, that the amount of holy ground for burials was certainly insufficient for the ancient custom of giving each body its individual place. When all the graves were full, huge trenches were dug in all of the cemeteries of the churches, and into them the new arrivals were dumped by the hundreds, and they were packed in there with dirt, one on top of the other, like a ship's cargo, until the trench was filled. What more can one say, except that so great was the cruelty of heaven, and perhaps also that of man, that from March to July of that same year, between the fury of the pestiferous sickness and the fact that many of the sick were badly treated or abandoned in need because of the fear that the healthy had, more 
than 100,000 human beings are believed to have lost their lives for certain inside of the walls of the city of Florence. Whereas, before the deadly plague, one would not even have estimated that there were actually that many people dwelling within the city. The Black Death, as it became known, was the start of the second plague pandemic, the first occurring almost a thousand years prior. It also is known as the Pestilence, the Great Mortality, or the Plague, and it was a bubonic plague pandemic which lasted from 1346 to 1353, and it was the worst pandemic in recorded human history. And that's saying something, because there is a list of something like 253 recorded pandemics in human history. And those are just the recorded ones. The Black Death earned its top spot by killing as many as 200 million people from Western Eurasia to Northern Africa. It is spread by fleas and likely person-to-person -person through aerosols. Now, there have been many theories about how the Black Death initially began to spread. New theories are still produced today. At the time, it was thought by some that the conjunction of three planets caused the outbreak. Rats, lice, and fleas are a common modern explanation, but no specific theory is universally accepted. The lack of hygiene practices at the time also did not help. The outbreak in Europe began in summer 1347, and by autumn of that same year, it had reached Egypt as well. Mecca was infected in 1348 by pilgrims performing the Haji, one of the five pillars of Islam, and an action that one must do at least once in their lifetime. The text I read from earlier, the Decamrian, was written during the time of the outbreak, and it paints a bleak and vivid picture about what life was like during the worst of the plague. Brother abandoning brother, cures not working, the fear that people felt, people probably thought that the world was ending during the worst of it. Hearing it told from someone who was alive at the time makes it feel more real than it does just reading history articles about it, because it adds that personal touch of authenticity and really lets you imagine what horrors they saw and went through. You can see a real person's first-hand words about it. But a disease isn't just deadly by what it does to those it infects, but also how it spreads. If a disease is crazy dangerous but not able to spread, it'll burn itself out. So how did it spread? And what were its symptoms? And how did people try to treat it? The plague spread around partially due to the ship and trade travel. As any time any ship landed in a port, there was a chance it would bring the plague with it. When infected pests like rats and fleas that carried the plague left the ship upon arriving in a port and spreading once they reached land. Areas with less trade did see less outbreak than other areas with more developed trade routes. People attempting to flee areas with the disease would also bring it to less infected areas as well. One popular method used to try and treat, or even cure, the disease during this time period included what is known as the Vicari Method named after the doctor who first proposed its use, which involved taking a healthy chicken and having its back and rear plucked clean of feathers and placed onto the swollen lymph nodes of the infected person. When the chicken began to show signs of illness, doctors assumed it was sucking the disease from the person it was being applied to. Another method used to try and cure the disease was to chop a snake into pieces and rub the diced parts all over the swollen areas. People also made potions, such as the Four Thieves Vinegar. Bloodletting, the withdrawal of blood from a patient to cure a disease, was also used, as well as cleaning the air, because it was thought that bad air caused the disease. Another preventative measure included holding a bouquet of flowers to the face to ward off the bad air and fumigate the lungs. This is where the ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies comes from. Despite these and many 
many other supposed cures that existed at the time, there was little effect when it came to real treatments and cures that were successful. Remember the text from earlier. Neither a doctor's advice nor the strength of medicine could do anything to cure the illness. On the contrary, either the nature of the illness was such that it afforded no cure, or else the doctors were so ignorant that they could not recognize its cause, and as a result, could not prescribe the proper remedy. Again, it adds that personal touch of authenticity to hear it told from someone who was there and paints a truly bleak and horrifying picture at what it was like to live through this. Symptoms included fever reaching as high as 106 degrees Fahrenheit or 41 degrees Celsius, aching joints, an overall feeling of discomfort, and also vomiting. Gangrene is also possible. However, there also was buboes, an inflammation of the lymph nodes in the groin, neck, and armpits, which oozed blood and pus if opened. Accounts from the time reported that these would grow as large as eggs or even apples. People also commonly had rashes, which could have been the results of the flea bites. Bubonic plague also wasn't the only type going around. There are three forms of plague. They are bubonic plague, septicemic plague, and pneumonic plague. Out of the three, bubonic was the most common, and the others have their own unique symptoms, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move on from covering the symptoms of those, since the most common type has been covered. And, to, and I want to get to the story that this video is titled after, now that we have context on the era and what the Black Death was. Throughout 1347, 1348, and 1349, the disease continued to spread across Europe. Again, trade and people fleeing heavily infected areas increased the rate of spread. But some areas were lucky and didn't face major outbreaks. One such area was Norway. With the plague spreading, Norway closed itself off and only allowed traders to come ashore following a quarantine period. With travel to Scandinavia as a whole difficult at the time, once they became aware of the outbreak in Europe and Africa, they had time to prepare. With this disease raging everywhere, I'm sure they were taking every precaution to keep it out that they could at the time. Trade was important though, and had to continue, but the authorities were determined to make sure that it was done safely. Knowing that trade ships were partially responsible for spreading the disease, Norway barred merchant ships until they underwent a quarantine period. After the period passed, if the crew were in good health, then they were allowed to leave their ship and unload their cargo. Another thing that was watched for was signs that the ship was infested with fleas and rats. If, if it was, it was not allowed to unload its cargo and it was instead sent back. Overall, the area was kept relatively safe, and the simple procedures kept the plague from entering Norwegian shores and cities. The safeguards helped trade continue safely, when elsewhere it was one of the biggest reasons for the spread of the disease. Then, in 1349, one ship, carrying a wool shipment, seemed to break the quarantine rules when it ran aground near Bergen. Why it ran aground was horrifying, because it turns out this ship which doesn't seem to have a known name, was a ghost ship, and everyone on board was dead. When this ship left port in England, the crew on board were all alive and healthy. We don't know much about the voyage, but we have a few details about what happened based on what was found. Once the outbreak on the ship began, sometime after leaving port, there were likely efforts made to quarantine the sick crew apart from the healthy crew. But due to the infected rats and fleas on board, the plague continued spreading. It spread person to person, and infected crew members started dying. Until finally, everyone died and the ship was left drifting at sea. 
If only it had drifted out into the ocean and sank, or ran aground in some remote place where no one would have been in danger. But no, it ran aground offshore near Bergen. By chance, the ship would drift into one of the only places where the outbreak hadn't reached. And unfortunately for all the efforts Norway had done to keep itself quarantined from the disease, all of it was in vain. It's not known if Norway was the ship's original destination, but that was where it ended up drifting once everyone had died. You gotta wonder if the last person on board realized that they were alone, and what must have gone through their mind if they did. That would have been horrifying to know that you were alone on a ship with nothing but dead bodies. By the time the ship ran aground and was discovered, no one was left alive to give any kind of report of exactly what had happened. From this ghost ship, the disease spread into the region by rats and fleas. The, the only ones left on board who were alive. From there, the outbreak then spread further into Russia and Sweden. By the time it was all over, what that ghost ship brought to Norway killed as much as one-third of the whole population. You really gotta wonder, what did the people who found the wrecked ship and the bodies on board think? Someone had to be sent to investigate the ship when it ran aground. And did any of them survive the outbreak? They might have expected a crew simply violating quarantine, but instead, they found the worst case scenario they could have. Truly though, they must have thought they walked into a nightmare, and it truly does have the plot of a horror movie that we might see today. That whole scenario is legitimately scary. A ship drifting into your country and crashing, and when you go investigate, you just find everyone is dead. Can you imagine how that would how that would be to find that? It'd be horrifying. And then from there, the rats and fleas escape and spread into the country where you've kept this scary disease from faraway places out for so long, and then everyone you know starts dying? It's such a creepy way for the outbreak to arrive. And the fact it killed maybe as many as one-third of everyone in the country just makes it even more horrifying. So the disease spread, it's run rampant all over Northern Africa, and now Russia, and everywhere in between. So what happened next? During this time, the disease continued to spread across Europe, Africa, and into the Middle East. However, details about the outbreak that occurred in Norway are sparse, but we have more complete records from Western Norway specifically. We know the ship likely ran aground in August, and the outbreak had become widely spread by that autumn. Western and Eastern Norway were both severely impacted, though the effects of the disease in Northern Norway are basically unknown. But we do know that by 1500, the population of Norway was only half of what it had been in 1300. Even roughly 150 years after the outbreak, the population of the country had only returned to half the levels that had been before it. Because of the impact of the Black Death in the country, Norway lost its position as a major kingdom and basically stagnated for centuries. Again, when you look at the numbers and read testimony from the actual people who were there, people at the time really must have thought the world was ending. And who can blame them? The disease didn't just go away after a while. It had outbreaks from 1374 all the way throughout 1400, 1438 to 39, 1456 to 57, 1464 to 66, 1481 to 85, 1500 to 1503, 1518 to 31, 1544 to 48, 1563 to 66, 1573 to 88, 1596 to 99, 1602 to 1611, 1623 to 40, 1644 to 1654, and 1664 to 1667. The second plague pandemic lasted centuries, with small outbreaks basically occurring every year throughout Europe. The outbreak in the middle 14th century killed so many people 
that it definitively earned the title as the worst pandemic in history. While we'll never know exact numbers, they estimate in range from 40 to 60 percent of Europe's population died, and in, and it took centuries to bounce back to what it had been before the outbreak. The outbreak later became known as the Black Death because of this. The Second Plague pandemic would last from the 14th century to as late as the early 19th century, consisting of multiple outbreaks throughout these centuries, some far more severe than others. The Great Plague of London from 1665 to 1666 was the last major bubonic plague outbreak of the Second Plague pandemic to occur in England. The Third Plague pandemic would begin in the 19th century and last from 1855 until 1859, though it was considered active until as late as 1960. This was the third of the three pandemics, with the Black Death marking the beginning of the second. Despite all the horror out of the pandemics, the fact that one of the outbreaks occurred because a ship whose whole crew was dead drifted into one of the only places the plague hadn't reached is still one of the creepiest stories from all of it. You really gotta wonder what the full story of the outbreak on that ship was, and what the last person alive was thinking. Maybe they, maybe they laid in their bed unaware? Maybe they tried to steer the ship out to sea to spare others from suffering their fate? Maybe they knew they were all alone and surrounded by the dead bodies of their fellow crew who had days earlier been alive and healthy, and there was nothing that they could do but wait to die too, all alone. Whoever the last person on the ship was, their final hours could make a horror story just as much as what the people who found the wrecked ship discovered could. So many questions can be asked about the details of the outbreak on the ship that we don't have answers to because no one was alive to record the details. Ultimately, we will never know exactly what happened, but we know what happened because of it. Ghost ships are creepy. There's something so unsettling about finding a ship drifting at sea with no one on board and no sign of what happened to them, and I found this specific topic while trying to find the first ghost ship story in history. You know, I was, I was curious. And I read this, and I was just creeped out. You know, this is a creepy story. This is something different, though. This is a ghost ship that's horrifying. It's, uh, instead of just creepy. The people who boarded and found the bodies, you know, whoever those people were, walked into their literal worst nightmare. You know, you've kept this horrifying disease out of your country, but then here it is. It's here, and the way it arrived is possibly the scariest way it could have. Coming in on a ship full of corpses and unleashed by the rats and fleas on board before you even realize it. It's a horror movie plot. I never thought I'd find a ghost ship story scarier than the Orang Madan. Uh, this would be a contender just because of what happened afterward. And at the time, in the 14th century, it had to be one of the scariest things those people could have ever thought of, let alone seen. Ghost ships just fascinate, and they always have. They've always fascinated me, and they fascinate many people. You know, from the disappearances of the HMS Terror in Erebus, to the SS Bachimo, to the Mary Celeste, and heck, even those random abandoned North Korean ships that just wash up that wash up on Japan's shore every year, which is a whole topic in and of itself. There's just something about empty ships drifting at sea that makes the mind wonder. Fictional ones are cool too, and I'm open-minded when it comes to the paranormal. I've had paranormal things happen to me, but the ones I've always found more interesting are the ones that were definitely real. The only exception is the aforementioned Orang Madan, which is dubious, but in my opinion, still the creepiest ghost ship story ever, and one I might make a video on someday because every time it sends a, it sends a chill down my spine. So the question is, why would these perfectly intact ships be abandoned? You know, and what happened to their crew and when? Obviously, this story is a little different when it comes to ghost ships. We know what happened to the crew. But in, in general, it's creepy to think about. And again, this story about the whole crew being dead when the ship was found 
in some ways, is creepier. Because we know the fate they suffered, and it was horrible. By the way, quick side note. Uh, but one thing that always adds to an extra creepiness level to ghost ships, for me, is when they're found not just drifting, but still sailing under their own power. Underway, with engines still running, I legit had a chill go down my spine just thinking about that right now. You know, that just makes it even creepier for me. And ghost ships aren't something from some bygone age that happen anymore. They still happen. You know, the most recent one I know of is the Yang Yu Sing number 18 from January 2021. So, again, side note, I just wanted to make a mention of that. Ghost ships are cool. Alright, ghost ships are cool. They have a lot of mystery. And this is kind of a standout ghost ship story because... It's a rare exception where we know the fate that befell the crew. And this whole sickness killing an entire crew thing is also the exact plot to an episode of Dragon's Race to the Edge, and I can't help but wonder if this is the story where they got that idea. Uh, anyway, back to it. Uh, back to the topic. This was the story of how a ghost ship killed one-third of Norway's population. I... It brought the infamous Black Death to the country, which had up until that point managed to keep it out. And it's just scary to think about. And, you know, I've said it before, but you gotta wonder, you know, what those who were there at the time were thinking. You know, the Black Death is probably one of the most infamous events in history. And for us today, it's this long ago thing that I don't think we can really comprehend the scale of, you know? All we have are just the numbers. You know, and it's something that I personally don't know many details on. You know, I, I generally understand what happened, but there's just so many things that go into this story, and ultimately it was so long ago that none of us will ever know all the details. It was a century-spanning thing. It wasn't a one-and-done outbreak. And I found researching this to be interesting, and the ghost ship story was what got my attention and made me want to tell the story of how a ghost ship could kill so many people. Usually ghost ships are just a thing people find and can't explain. Again, like the Mary Celeste. Look that one up if you don't know the story. It's weird. But this is different. Anyway, that wraps the story up. You now know how a ghost ship killed one third of Norway. I hope you enjoyed this ghost ship story that I have never seen anyone cover before, which is surprising. There's a lot of horror YouTubers out there that cover topics and stories exactly like this, but this one has never been shared as far as I've been able to find, so I wanted to share it. It's a topic I can't believe none of them have jumped on. And if you think about it, it was honestly a case of serious bad luck that the ship happened to drift where it did. You know, we don't know if it was going to Norway originally, we just know its destination was north. There's a lot of places it could have been going, but it just happened to drift to a place where the plague hadn't reached. So yeah, I think out of all the bad luck in history, this one's probably somewhere high up on that list. So yes, I hope you enjoyed. This was my first mini-documentary that covered a specific event rather than a full topic like my Loch Ness Monster one did. And if there's a topic you'd like to see me make a future mini-doc about, then let me know and I'll look into it, and if it interests me, I might make a video on it. Generally, I want to make videos like this on mysteries from throughout history, prehistoric stuff from any prehistoric age, and occasionally cryptids. Again, it's just stuff I find interesting. Full-length documentaries will be less frequent than these short ones. Um, those take weeks to make. You know, I have to do all the research, I have to write, I have to record and edit all of those. The Loch Ness Monster one took me about two months. Uh, my next full-length one will be about the fauna throughout the Cretaceous, beginning at the beginning of the Cretaceous and going all the way to the end, and that'll cover dinosaurs, mammals, plants, marine life, and so on. I'm going to start working on that in a few months, and bigger topics like that will be saved for the bigger and more in-depth projects, and they'll probably be mostly prehistory related. I know early human species and human evolution is a topic I'd be interested in covering, I think my next mini-documentary will be about an interesting, obscure, early hominid that kind of throws a wrench into some of the uh, ideas we have for human evolution. Um, 
But honestly, anything prehistory is fair game. I just find anything that's prehistory interesting. You know, the Carboniferous, the Devonian, the Jurassic, all of it. And that should be obvious since I based my books around prehistoric life. These mini documentaries will cover smaller events, which the full length documentaries can't be dedicated to because they're just smaller incidents and stories, or I can make a more summarized version of a lengthier topic. Again, uh, full length or mini, they will all just be about stuff I find interesting and I want to research. And since I teased it, I will also probably make a mini doc about the Orang Madan at some point. And by the way, that wasn't a joke earlier when I said that the story creeps me out every time I think about it. Especially the SOS message. If you've not seen the SOS message that people heard, it's super scary. Like, legitimately one of the creepiest things you could ever hear over Morse code. <laughs> I don't understand how that story hasn't been made into a horror movie. It could be so scary if you did it right. And I know audio content overall tends to get more views and engagement, be it my audio stories read from my upcoming books or the recent documentary, but I can't make this kind of content all the time. That's why I make gaming stuff in between, and occasionally I do still make camping vlogs if I think there is interesting and funny enough stuff that happened on a specific trip. You know, to give you people something to enjoy while these more intensive and time-consuming projects, you know, are in development. Even a mini-documentary like this takes a while to research and write. This script is over 10 pages. The Loch Ness Monster one was almost 40. So anyway, if you enjoy this content, I'll try to make it as regular thing as I can because I love making it. I learned last year that, you know, when I started making my audio stories... I love making content like this. It's probably my favorite kind of video to make. But expect gaming or other types of content between the releases of projects like this. So, thank you for watching. Check out my Loch Ness Monster documentary or my original audio narrations if you want more audio content. And again, between these bigger audio projects, I make gaming content in a more casual and relaxed format that you might also enjoy. I don't have anything gaming planned right now. I'm kind of just waiting on FNAF Plus to come out for my next series. I did buy Security Breach last month while it was on sale, but I wasn't really impressed, so I may or may not release that video. All right, rant over. Please check out some of my other content on my channel, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed and learned something new.